Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is another day of Island Forward Live. Let me make sure I get my camera ready. We're going to have two guests in here today, and the topic today is a topic that I am not an expert on, and you know that I don't want to pretend to be an expert, but it is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and so we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and the Caribbean, opportunities, threats, and we have two experts I want to bring on. We have Trevor Forrest, the CEO of a company called 876 Solutions, and then Melissa Daly is going to be speaking as well. So this is something that's important to me because we have an opportunity to leapfrog in the Caribbean. And obviously, hackers don't care which country. In. Some of them just want to have fun. And we need to be extremely cautious about our data, especially personal data, private data. We need to be cautious on the financial side as well. Our, our companies tend to be smaller in the Caribbean than in the US, so absorbing a big financial hit, a theft would be a problem. And theft is only one thing. So that's what we're doing today. Before I bring in Trevor Forrest, I want to hear from you guys. Where are you watching from? This is something we do every time we start off. We, we tend to get people from all over uh, the world watching. And so I want to, to hear, just give a shout out, post in the comments where you are. Uh, we're streaming live on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn. Uh, we are on Blue Moho Capital's YouTube page and on, on my personal Twitter profile. So again, thank you as always for joining me on our Wednesday afternoon. I'm a few minutes late because I just did a fireside chat with Ingrid Riley for her live event, Digital Caribbean, and you will get to see clips from that. We, we had a lot of fun. So we got Chicago in the building. Thank you very much. I uh, see Ricardo is saying good morning. Atlanta, Georgia, big up the place. Come on, anybody in Jamaica besides the guests we're about to bring in? Uh, keep telling me where you're coming from. But uh, England, this is, this is all I'm waiting to say. I want to see my UK people, right? Daryl McIntosh, big up Daryl. Daryl is in Chicago. Respect, man. Right? We go way back. Really good to see, see Daryl in here. Andrew. Atlanta, Georgia, but you're missing for a deal. Yes, you are. Stephen, wow, Stephen Fawcetta is in Kentucky. Big up, Stephen. One day you guys are going to know why this guy's name is so important. Uh, very integral to what we're doing at Blue Moho Capital and his team. Keon, I'm kind of jealous. He's in California this week. I am jealous. Greg Williams, one of our business partners on the film side, is in Canada. Calgary, Canada, to be specific. Dallas, Texas, Jamie, you're going to hear his name again soon. And then we got Canada. So and Trevor, I want to bring on Trevor Forrest. Then we're going to bring on Melissa Daly. Spend about 15 minutes talking a little bit about what do we mean by cybersecurity? Uh, where are the threats? What is Jamaica doing? Big up to and Tobago in the building. Big up. I need to see a Jamaica flag show up in here, guys. Please. Mr. Forrest, are you good, sir? Yeah, man. I'm good. Hey, man. We're hearing you loud and clear. You're, you're looking sharp. Let me see. Let me see. I can do it this way. Yeah, man. So, how is the weather in Jamaica? Because... You want to show the whole of my office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, well, I want, actually just wanted the whole of your title to show up, <laughs> actually. Ah, okay. So, look here. We've got some more Waterbury Connecticut. We've got Toronto, Canada. So, we've got people from, from a number of countries. And I appreciate that you don't owe me your time. So, Trevor. Give us a little background on what is 876 Technology Solutions and, and what you're doing, where you're based. Um, all right, so 876 um, Solutions is uh, based in Jamaica. Um, we started, I founded that company in 2006. Um, when I moved back to Jamaica, I was um, in the US about 15 years um, prior. I moved back here, founded the company. Um, we're one of the first cloud services providers in Jamaica, and um, mm. we we have kind of grown in our services since then. So um, we do cloud hosting um, uh, services. Um, we do web application development. Um, we do information and data security. Okay. Um, we also do uh, enterprise content management. Um, and then more more lately, um, based on a restructuring that was done about two years ago, we now do uh, business process optimization, uh, big data analytics platforms on blockchain, um, design and consulting. So, and we, we, we accomplish a lot of this through, through our partnerships 
Um, we have some major strategic partners, IBM, uh, Red Hat, Cloudera, uh, F5 Networks, um, uh, Signature. Um, so wow. So That's a big one. Signature, so the e-signature solution, and um, Global Sign. So those are those are key strategic partners for for what we do. Um, and uh, we've been we've been doing pretty pretty well over the past you know 12, 13 years. Um, one thing to <laughs> to note about the company is from the day it started, um, it was created and designed to be a virtual company, mm. um, which in two thousand and six was beyond a novel thought. Yeah, um, but it's a whole different perspective on it in today's day and age, given what's prevailing with COVID. So uh, many people didn't think it would work back then, um, but you know. Well, here, here we are today. Everybody we are working, um, you know, and, and, and we've, been, we've been doing doing pretty pretty well. No, well, so, so that is great, and I love that. So we go back. Man, Trevor, I don't want to date her. Well. <laughs> we knew each other from uh, like '99 or something. I mean, this is yeah, I think before that. Uh, yeah, yeah. When Nine, Real, Vibes, Real Vibes was yeah, Real Vibes was 2001 onwards. Yeah, so, so just, just when Real Vibes was was, <laughs> was taking off way yeah. back when, and and yeah, we stayed yeah. in touch, and and recently you were on a webinar in Jamaica. Well, a webinar broadcast from Jamaica where I was watching as well, and that that's what prompted the cybersecurity discussion, as well as Melissa that will come on after this. And you laid out some things that shocked me. Right, I already knew about two-factor authentication because I'd helped. To, you know, I was in charge of launching the internet banking platform for Jamaica National, and we worked on that. And, and we had to learn a bit more about cybersecurity. But some of the things that you showed on that. Webinars, threads are stuff that I've never heard of. Not phishing, we know about that, but just give us a quick idea of some of the cybersecurity threats that we as users now need to be aware of now that our lives have pretty much moved online. And in the Caribbean, it happened almost overnight. Right, right. So so I think um with the with the pandemic situation, um individuals and companies have, have you know, you know are seeing a, a whole new norm of how they have to function. And what that has done is it has moved people from, you know, the workplace to home. Um, it has stretched office networks um, outside of the confines of, of their very secure uh, brick and mortar buildings to, you know, extended remote um, work and access. Um, and it has presented some challenges for individuals and companies, but opportunities for, you know, nefarious actors in, in the cyberspace. So um, one of the things that you start to find is that you have increased use of online services and online services are, are uh, very interesting threat surfaces because people tend to present information um, I'd say willy nilly on, on these platforms without even a thought of what is happening to that information when they submit it. You know, they employ these these online services to get a job done. Um, but they apply the same trust level that they would if they went into um, an actual physical location. And, and that's a very dangerous thing to do because um, they the trust level cannot be the same. The security level um, is, is completely different. So a couple of things that we've seen an uptick in uh, since since COVID, and this is something that was predicted. Um, we've seen a serious uptick in, you know, as you mentioned, phishing. Yeah. But we've seen some interesting developments in online um, activity. Uh, to 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 capture and manipulate and use uh, people's personal or sensitive data for um, you know uh, nefarious activity. Um, so uh, one of those, uh, and I think the session you were speaking about um, was a session I did with the broadcast community, broad, yeah, broadcast commission, and. Um, uh, 
uh, I mentioned a particular thread called Man in the Browser, which is something that very few people are familiar with or even aware of because most times, you know, we implement a lot of security features, passwords, uh, two-factor authentication, and, you know, we think, okay, you know, we're pretty much okay and safe. Um, but the the threat actors are constantly evolving. They're very clever. They're very innovative. And one of the things they, they've been using to devastate and effect lately is this thing called the man in the browser attack. Um, this is very different from the man in the middle attack. Um, okay. But it's a very, very clever and very dangerous uh, threat where everybody uses a browser, right? Um, and what you find is that, you know, you add these neat little features to your browser, they call them extensions, and I have a couple of dozen on mine. But nobody ever checks to see if those extensions are legit or secure. They just use them because it does this particular thing that you like. You never check where it comes from. You never check who develops it and so on. But what's happening now is some of these extensions are being used Wow. Um, as uh, threat tools that go between you, the person, and your online uh, service. And you never know that it's doing that because it's acting in the background and you never see it, right? Because of the, 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 the browser extensions do what they do in the background and they all keep functioning. And one of the really interesting things about these man in the browser attacks is that they circumvent two factor authentication. Oh, how, so so my information is being sent. I think it's being sent to the bank that I'm about to log in to go and move some money around, but it, it actually is going to somebody else that looks like the bank or well no, actually it's it's even more more clever than that. A, a, a typical scenario is you go to a bank online and you put your information in. And you expect certain responses and, and, and questions from that online portal. And you right. see that. You see the questions come back. Please enter your name. Please enter your password. Uh, wait. And then comes back. Enter your you know two-factor code and whatever. All of that still happens. You still see it. But what's happening in the background is that uh, extension is presenting you with the questions and then taking your responses and then acting like you in responding to the bank. So what happens is you still see everything running normal and even the bank's system see everything as normal. The only thing that is different is the transaction that occurs. So you may go to a bank and say, look, I want to transfer, you know, $500 from one account to another. And you enter all the information in the, the nefarious extension says, yeah, sure, uh, $500, no problem. But it then sends a request for $5,000. Mm. And you still see a $500 request, but the bank sees a $5,000 request. Wow. You get your 500 transferred and they get 4500 um transfer to you know where where they want it to go um and these things happen in such a way that both people in the transaction see a legitimate looking request mm. so when you now discover that your account is four thousand five hundred dollars short you go to the bank and you complain and the bank says well no you are on on this day and you yes and you requested thousand yep. dollars and you're like no i didn't so what our records show this <laughs> um you were on on that day yes you did request five thousand no oh, five hundred <laughs> so, uh, what you find happening is you know some interesting situations start to prevail and uh it is part and parcel of you know to one of the technologies that we're offering to 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 mitigate these kinds of of of, of attacks because banks or financial institutions or online entities, insurance companies, retail companies, and so on, they don't know this is happening. All they know is that they're getting complaints, they're losing revenue, 
And what happens is if if you don't know it's happening, then you can't mitigate it, right? All right. So what we try to do is to help, um, in this particular case, to help uh, companies um, mitigate these kinds of, of attacks um, over and above the ones that already happened. So, so that's one of the things that we do. Um, it's a solution that we offer with our with our partners, um, F5, um, and it is one of the most dangerous threats right now because um, it is very difficult for a bank. So, it's not one of those threats that a bank can install, you know, a piece of hardware or edge protection to stop immediately. You have to know it's happening most times. Um, so, so what we, we try to do is to help help entities to mitigate against threats like that. And there's been an uptick, and there will be an uptick in threats like that because more and more people have to know function online. Exactly. Um, so, so, so I like that you explain an ex a very clear example of threats that exist. And then, when threats exist, obviously, as an investor, we believe that means opportunities exist, right? Your business is is domiciled in what we consider a strong long-term growth industry. Right? We are a tech-enabled society, uh, so where do you see the opportunities for 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 your company or for for others of us looking in that space uh, within this right. industry to invest? So, so what you're going to find is that you're going to see that um, uh, the the a couple of things are going to happen um, within within the industry. You're going to find that um, you know budgets and, and budgetary allocations for for security and those kinds of things are going to are going to change. Um, there are going to be some adjustments that that um, companies have to make because you know they didn't, they didn't allocate money for what what is prevailing now in, in the COVID space. Right. Um, so you're going to find that. There's going to be a shift in in in, in priorities to, to things like you know perimeter security, identity and access controls, you know VPN and remote access and that kind of stuff. So companies that so the, these are kind of like you know you know some of your your, your what you call hotspot areas, um, uh, you know security training and, and awareness, um, you know greater greater automation. For, for certain processes um, to remove um, and and uh, you know you know human interaction in some in instances and to, to also cut costs to be more efficient um, and, and another area that that is 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 very important which again sneaks under the radar is companies who have partners mm. uh, these partners are sometimes smaller entities now. Financial companies and you know uh, fintechs or, or banks or, or companies like that, they have a lot of partners, and the security that prevails for the partners doesn't necessarily mirror what prevails for the bank. And a chain, you know, is as strong as its weakest link. So what you're going to find is that some of the larger entities have to now assess the security profile of their partners because. The, the the hacker isn't going to attack the bank when he can attack the partner and get the same thing. Exactly. Partner security profile is 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 you know less than that of the bank. You know, hackers are notorious the lazy people, so they see the <laughs> easy way. Oh, if 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 you can get into you know a highly protected organization through a low security um, uh, entry point, then that's what you're going to do. So these high security entities now have to reassess and look at, you know, making their partners um, more aware and more secure. Cyber aware. So you might find that uh, products and solutions that that you know solve these kinds of problems, companies that offer those kinds of services and solutions, um, there's going to be an increase in in in, in demand. Uh, for those kinds of, of companies and solutions as um, their paradigm sets in. So, so that's, that's something that we've, we've, we've you know, taken uh, a serious look at. Uh, uh, just over two years ago, we completely restructured our <clears throat> service platforms because 
you know, we recognized that security was getting to be so, so dynamic in, in you know, what was happening. Right. And this was pre-COVID. Yep. Um, that we simply couldn't keep up with it, with the platforms that we had. We couldn't keep up with the, the, the rapidly evolving threat space. So we, mm. we completely revamped our platforms to to be able to deal with, with what we saw as the dynamic nature and the evolving nature of a lot of these. And, you know, it turned out to be a really good move because COVID now accentuates Right. A lot of those things, and it put us in a position to be able to provide some services for 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 many clients that that would allow them to now uh, better protect themselves and perhaps even respond to to the the real threats that exist now. All right. No. So so that's a, a good set of information for us. I'm going to now bring in Melissa Trevor and and. Take you off, but stay around because I want to bring both of you back. And I especially going to end up wanting to talk about national IDs, biometric yeah. IDs, yeah. and blockchain. You're a blockchain guy as well. Yeah. So yeah. A whole bunch of people want to ask about that one. So let me bring in Melissa now, but thank you very much for that information, Trevor. Very eye-opening and scary to some extent, but glad that <laughs> you exist. Yeah. It to always has that effect. <laughs> yeah, man. All right. So, guys, now I'm going to bring in Melissa Daly. This is uh, a young woman here in the U.S. of Jamaican heritage who I met through LinkedIn, funny enough. She's seen some of the streams. So let me bring in uh, Melissa. Hi. Hi, Melissa. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am great. Melissa is the uh, president and CEO of Orca Intelligence, and, and she's been talking to me about cyber awareness and opportunities that she felt existed in the Caribbean for people there to to be trained and, and become experts in this specific area. So I'd let you just tell us a little bit about Orca Intelligence and, and what's your connection to the Caribbean? Sure. Uh, so Orca Intelligence, let's see, it's my organization that I started in 2014. So we've been around for about a little over six years now. Uh, we service mostly in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm based in D.C. Um, and we mostly service as a subcontractor for federal projects and some state work as well on the city side. Oh, yeah. Great. And what's your connection to the Caribbean? So my family were all all Jamaican. I'm the only one born here. So, of course, they call me the, you know, the American, right? Yep, yep. Uh, Nicole, I, Nicole, I, our, our mutual friend, Nicole. Yep. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I have family in Papine, so if anyone's in Papine, hello, hello. <laughs> and I've, I've never met anybody that says something like, I have family in Papine, like, I have family in Kingston or, you know, Clarendon, but to be so specific yeah. within Kingston to say Papine, yeah. I love yeah. it. My uh, uncle goes to the market every morning hey. to get his stuff and go right back up to Mama River yeah. Road. I, I so. grew up going to that market in Papillon, so. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. So that is my connection there. Um, so I'm always looking for opportunities to strengthen the community and strengthen the island and the Caribbean as much as possible. Well, and, and so that's how we connected. You, you knew that we have a plan to essentially help build an infosys of the Western Hemisphere where you feel that uh, software development could be done in the Caribbean, near shore to the Caribbean. We could have you know, contractors there and not have companies going all the way to India or going to the Ukraine. Yeah. So you specifically reached out to me to talk about the cyber security world, the cyber awareness op opportunity. So what do you envision happening that allows us to do you know, something in Jamaica that, that pays better, uh, gives people a higher standards of living while working on global projects yeah it's all about educating the workforce right because right now data is the new currency everyone thinks property is like you know a great investment but it really is data and so i think it's important to put cybersecurity at the forefront of that data and to make sure that people are educated as well um, in order to manage the data and manage cybersecurity. there's nothing like empowering people with education Mm -hmm. So that when they're out in the workforce, when they're with their families, they're able to feel the confidence that they're secure. You never want your child to walk alone in the in, a, in the night by themselves, right? right. I'm gonna tell you right now, like 
you know, so when I go when I go visit my family in Jamaica, I'm not I'm sorry, I'm not walking out down the street by myself at night. I'm just not just not gonna happen, right? So it's the same way that you want to empower people to work as a community to uh, strengthen their cybersecurity awareness. It should be a community effort. Okay, so, so I want to point out there are parts of Miami I won't walk alone at night either. So. Exactly. I'm not. I'm not. Point, I'm just not. I'm not. You know, singling out. At yeah, well, all. Right. You're, you're a female, so we have to. Exactly. Have to have Correct. But we need to have that same level of awareness uh, on the information highway uh, yes. that we deal with in, in the virtual world, the digital exactly. world. So, so, so that's that's important. So, as you know, I sit on the advisory board for the Caribbean School of Data, which which is based at Mona School of Business at UA. In, mm -hmm. in Kingston, Seven Islands Recovery, and it's, it's funded by Google.org. And we focus on data literacy for unattached youth, roughly between age 16 to, to age 21. And, and so we felt it was important that digital literacy, computer literacy wasn't enough, data literacy was going to be crucial. But then once these kids learn to be data literate, they still need additional skills to be able to get jobs yeah. in the job market. What do you see? As, as the job opportunities that will exist? And how do we train these people? Is it that they need to go and get a bachelor's degree? Are there special certifications they can do instead? What would, what, how would you explain it? So it's a mixture. Um, I've been in the industry for you know a little over 20 years and I've seen people of uh, non-minorities without a bachelor's degree who have made it. Um, in the IT field, but then I see those who do have bachelor's degree in the IT fields who have not been as successful. So it's a it's a mixture. Um, it's really, at the end of the day, it's about critical thinking. Having those critical thinking skills, because you just don't wanna, because I've seen a lot of people who collected certifications, who've collected education. And I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm one sitting here with two degrees, right? So I'm not knocking education, but I'm saying as, as a, as an add value to your education, making sure that you're constantly learning. Every day I'm learning, I'm learning something new. Like with Trevor on this call, I was learning things new, right? And, and that's what it's about. It's about having these critical thinking skills and using the education that you have in order to empower yourself to, to learn more. So that's really the key. Cause those are the people that I'm hiring, right? Those right. are the people that we're all looking for is the ones that's gonna take it a bit further than saying, hey, I have this cert, so now you should hire me. It's more like I have this cert and this is what I know how to do with it. Ah, I love that. So before I bring in Trevor, I'm going to ask you one more question, Melissa. Uh, I hope I don't throw you for a loop, but in an ideal world, if, if capital wasn't your wasn't a constraint, you work on projects in the United States. Would you be able to hire people in Jamaica, Barbados, Bahamas, Cayman, if yep. they had the certifications? Yes. That, okay, that was a short answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. What would it take for you to be able to, to pull some of those people onto uh, projects that you have? Making sure, projects? making sure they're qualified. That's the, the main thing is to make sure they have the qualifications, make sure that they're um, able to handle the workload and handle the intensity. Be one of the things that I've heard with, uh, you know, offshore environments is a lot of organizations want to um i say hello so one of the things that i've heard about people hiring from near shore or offshore actually like over in most of the asian and east east european countries is that there's a loyalty factor mm. right they're not gonna, they're, they're, there's a, a uh, I'm gonna say a stereotype. There's a stereotype that there's loyalty, there's loyalty with trade secrets and no one's gonna run off and so on and so forth. And so um, that's one of the main things I believe that when we're bringing people into these environments to make sure that they are loyal, that they're going to have the critical thinking skills and that they wanna learn. They're eager, they're hungry. All right. so. I love that. So I'm going to now get Trevor ready and bring in Trevor and keep both of you on screen. So we're going to bounce some questions between you guys. Excited. Let me bring both of you on. Trevor, you're with us again. Yeah. I know you were listening. So I learned some stuff today. I hope you're learning something from Melissa because she's she's learning from you as well. Yeah. One of Hi, the Trevor. 
Yeah. Hi, how are you? Trevor, yeah, how are you? Me. Melissa, me, Trevor. Hello. <laughs> link up. So, one of the ones I want to definitely bring up now, because you are on the ground in that IT space, Trevor. You hire staff in the Caribbean. We talked about certifications. How easy or how hard has it been to identify qualified staff in the Caribbean with those critical thinking skills? Um, so it's, it's always been a challenge. Um, and let me let me explain why. My first challenge, um, and it you know, only started to get abated, you know, just a couple of years ago, really, two three years ago, was first getting people who could understand that you did not well, work is something you do. It's not a place you go. So that's the first thing. So mm. when you when you when you're a virtual business um, and you're you're, you're targeting people whose mindset is, oh, where am I going to go to work? Where do I sit down? Where is my desk and so on? Well, you know, that was always a challenge for, 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 for me. So for the longest time, I never hired anybody in Jamaica. Um, COVID has completely changed that. <laughs> I can, people realize that you really don't need to be in a physical location called the office to work. Um, the other thing, though, is, and, and I'm going to, you know, step on some toes here. Um, what I find from the standpoint of qualification is two main problems. Our universities, tertiary institutions, and to a certain extent, our secondary institutions, uh, are focusing on the wrong things when they're, you know, teaching our students. Um, most times, you know, they're, they're teaching them how to go out and work for somebody. Else. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Um, but the, 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 the more, you know, painful thing for us as, as people who are looking to hire is a lot of what is being taught is not in sync with what the industry needs. Wow, so there's a mismatch. So, so when you when you're searching for people, um, on paper it may look decent, but when you talk to them and you find out what they actually know, they really don't know what is required to do the job. So you have to train them again. And and I find that there isn't enough focus in in in, in some of our our educational institutions and and even in the curriculum to be in sync with what the industry needs are. Um, you, you can teach people what's in a book, that's fine, but applying that um, and applying that to a space that is uh, relevant or in a way that is relevant is a problem. So what you start finding is that people go to school, pay all this money, get a degree, and then they have to go out now and do secondary training. Wow. To bring them up to speed in these... Right different new areas that 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 are are you know where the industry has gone and the reason for that is our educational institutions do not adjust quickly enough to industry changes so you know it may take some somewhere like utech or u or one of those places four years to change their entire curriculum around a particular topic wow. In four years the need has changed again right you're late so, so you can't take four years to change um, a four-year or five-year program. So that's like, what, 10 years now? You're going to start matriculating people who are irrelevant. Right. Being faster and be more in tune to what the industry needs. And to do that, you need to invite industry in or bring people who are in the industry to augment the theory that you're teaching you know your your people, so it's very difficult to find the the ideal you know qualified people. Um, and the last thing is, for some reason, and I don't know how it is in the rest of the region, we don't do internships a lot. I'm mean, mm. talking credit based internships. So yes, I go to school, I I, I get educated. But when I go to get a job, somebody says, well, how much experience do you have? Well, how am I supposed to get the experience? I was doing school all this time. Doing school, yeah. You need to kind of integrate 
you know, internships so that while you're going to school, you're getting practical experience. So when you leave, you can actually have something on your resume that says, yeah, they actually do some work in the real world while I was going to school. Yes, I will. Um, so so it, that those factors cause it, cause it to be really challenging to find people, um, especially the ones that are very innovative in very innovative, but 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 the mindset sometimes is a little is a little uh, off. Let's oh, say. I need to work on that. <laughs> so, so I get the to... challenge we we typically you know had. Um, there are some real gems out there, um, but by and large, we tend to find um, it, it's a it's a real challenge to find people who one can work in the work anywhere manager own time. Yeah. Mindset and people who are in lockstep with the, 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 the evolving industry and the needs that, that you know even the tech industry uh, require. All right, so so I'm going to bring in Melissa and ask her a question, but I have a question and, and a comment on 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 Instagram. I'm doing behind the scenes here. So one of the comments says that training programs are not an overhead cost most companies want to undertake. Absolutely, and yeah, that is true. And and so the question she's asking, what is wrong with investing in training persons who are willing to learn? And so I, I would say to her, Carolyn, that from my standpoint, I, I think that companies are willing to invest in people who are willing to learn. They're not saying that they're not willing to train them. They also just want they don't want to have to train everything and have you forget what you're doing. If you went and did a certification for a year, two years, or four years, you should be coming out more more job ready. That's what you say in Trevor. Yeah, but but yeah, and, and like I said, it's not a fault of the the the, the, the person. Um, they're they're coming out based on what they're taught in school. I tend to blame the education institution, yeah. but at the same time, um, for the individual, training is an investment in yourself. Yeah. Right. So so don't wait on or depend on a company to train you. You can train. You can get the training yourself, and that grows you and mm -hmm. makes you more appealing. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that companies are not willing to invest um, uh, in, in training, uh, but you should be willing to invest in yourself as well, and that puts you in a better position to, to, to be more appealing to a wider range of, of, of opportunities out there. Exactly. So, so as I said, going to Melissa, I said to a lot of people now, I mentor a lot of young people. And I keep saying to them that you have an advantage that, that I didn't have growing up and that our parents didn't have before. Right? The, the, the internet makes everything instantly international and globally competitive. So work from home means work from anywhere. So the work that you are doing as a as some contractor in DC could be done in the Caribbean, in, in Jamaica, for example. But while that is an opportunity, it also means that you're now competing globally against people who can do work. So I look at like an ITT and what they do with their campuses in India. The, in, in in and you have to be aware of, of competing. So how do you plan to help people in the Caribbean, South and Jamaica be competitive on a global scale? So when you're doing these contracts in the US, you can hire from the Caribbean and not have to go to India. Yeah, that's a good question. So for uh, for me, one of the things that I like to concentrate on are the unique parts, right? So there's uniqueness in information technology. So one of the things that a lot of organizations aren't concentrating on are the different verticals that are specific to what you can deliver. So for example, uh, Orca Intelligence, our focus is healthcare, education, and property management. Those are the three things that we're focused on. Don't bring me finance, don't bring me any of that. Like, you know, those are our three main areas. And so I will encourage anyone to focus, right? Like have a niche, focus on something, make sure you know that industry in and out, right? So that's what's gonna make you unique. Also, the next thing is to how to uh, identify what data that you can start selling on your own. Mm. There's one reason why I'm not on Facebook. I don't want, I'm not giving my data away for free. Right, right, <laughs> for free, no. Right, and so I want people to start thinking like that. Start thinking like Facebook, start thinking like, you know, be creative with the data that you're capturing. If you're talking to people and they're like, you know what, I wish I had a database for this. 
will go off and create that database and bring it back and sell it, right? I, I need people to start thinking creatively. And then not only that, a lot of people are only thinking about software, but when we get into um, software being just, you know, uh, desktop software, but when we start getting into nanotechnology, biotechnology, right? There's going to be the increase of that aspect as well, where I think now we're talking about when we get into nanotechnology, now you're talking about buildings that are going to be gen created based off of technology. So we need to start thinking about that as a community, as an organization to prepare people for that type of thinking, because that's the critical thinking that we need to be ahead of. That's where everybody else is going. And so we need to be there, too. We don't want to be up flat footed. No, I, I love that you bring that up. So since we're talking about being forward thinking, I want to bring the conversation around now to to blockchain and then and then the national IDs that are coming into force in the Caribbean. We're looking at Barbados and Jamaica in particular. Here in the US, we have a social security number. We've we've had that national ID, which was a default ID, it didn't start out being our original national ID. But because I have a social security number. I'm able to open a bank account online. I can open an investment account. I can pay taxes. It's extremely easy for KYC, right? Yeah, know your customer versus in the Caribbean is a pain for me to do almost anything. It's been improving slowly, but it's still pretty ridiculous to open a bank account in Jamaica, for example. So Trevor, I know you, you, you know a lot more about uh, the national ID plan in Jamaica, for example. Uh, what do you see that accomplishing for Jamaica from an economic growth standpoint? Yeah. So, so the, the advent of the national ID system in Jamaica, that, that's like a seismic shift in, in everything that we, we want to do, currently do, um, did in the past. Because um, anybody who lives in Jamaica um, who complains about the time it takes to do things, um, how inefficient, you know, government services are. How how mundane some of the the transactions you have to do, regardless of where you go. It could be public or private sector, because people keep asking you for the same information over and over and over and over again. Um, if you have an issue with that, then what is embodied in the concept of the national ID? answers that that question solves that problem right because um, what the national id is meant to do is to act as a unique identifier that follows you from birth to death and even after that but but that is what it's meant to do and in, in creating such an identifier um people are now able to say you are who you say you are. Because the reason they ask you for all that information in, in the first place is they have no other way of verifying that you are who you say you are. All right. And if there was a standard way to do that, they wouldn't have to ask you for that information. Um, so so by creating this, this national ID um, system, then you will be able to, to seamlessly have a system that integrates with all of these other services that says Trevor Forrest or David Mullins or Melissa Daly is who she says or he says they are. Right. That, that's a major thing right there. Um, but not only uh, does, does it, it, it do that, um, what it also does is it allows governments now to streamline um, the, the plethora of services that they have mm -hmm. that are all, you know, sitting in different silos um, that are, are not accurate or, or, or that are duplicated and so on, and to bring them together and have them communicate. So when you go to one entity, that's a government service and they ask you for information, um, the next entity you go to just says, well, give me a national ID. And suddenly all of that information that is relevant to them comes. Right. If you don't have it, then they ask you for that. And what happens is over time, you have a matrix, and no pun intended there, right? Okay. But you have a matrix of information um, 
in different areas that that is representative of you based on the service you need right so now a lot of what you you the things you want to do suddenly become easier that creates opportunities for service delivery yep um, so that now private sector entities can now can now better deliver service to you because the information that they need they don't have to ask you about it anymore and i was just about to get to that question yeah. that Nicole <laughs> um so one of the challenges and one of the underlying concerns and threats is the concept of data sovereignty right um and i i, I typically call it self-sovereign data um and so what happens now is because you have this matrix of information stored in all of these various silos that are using your your national id to validate you and to provide services the question then comes up um that okay first of all this data is mine it's right. my info right. uh, what laws exist to to ensure that um you know person a over here doesn't share my data with person b and i didn't tell them to uh, which is the advent of the data protection legislation. But not only that, so I can control who, or, or I should be able to control who has access to my data and what they can do with it. Um, up to and including saying, I don't want you to have my data anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and so just like being able to go on Facebook and say, delete, give me back my information. Yes, but, but, but actually, remove it because one of the things that you know with google and facebook is you can ask them to remove your data in the united states but that data still exists in another jurisdiction on their networks there so 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 the way you 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 mitigate that is to create a, a scenario an environment of 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 data sovereignty where you are the one who possesses your data Ah. You control it, and you may do so via um, a, a, a digital wallet, for instance. And based on that level of control, instead of you asking them to get rid of your, your data, you say Click. that you no longer can see my data. So, so the way I think of that, I'm going to make sure I bring him this up, but the way I think of it is that when I do a, a login, when I go somewhere, sometimes it asks me to allow Hey, you can log in with LinkedIn or Google instead, right? So I log in with LinkedIn and it says, allow this app to see X, Y, and Z information from LinkedIn. I allow that. But later on, I can go back and then just say, you know what? That app can't see my LinkedIn info anymore. And I get to control that. I don't need to ask the company or that website to remove the LinkedIn access. I just go in and just click X and remove it. Yes, but you're able to control it. I have everywhere. control. Yeah, you're able to control it everywhere because what you just described allows you to control it on LinkedIn. Right. We're talking about broader. Well, I don't want my date of birth to be seen by anybody. Anybody. I just do that and everywhere it's gone. So wow. the right to be forgotten suddenly now becomes, you know, something that is more real than something that is taught. I love that. I love that. So Melissa, I'm going to bring you in and talk some more because I know this is I know you're not as familiar necessarily with NIDS, but I want to, to get your opinions on, on national IDs and just doing business in the Caribbean, doing business in Jamaica. As someone who, who has traveled. Oh, you're familiar? I'm a little familiar with it. Yeah, Actually, so you're I have my bank, bank account, account in Jamaica. <laughs> and what, what was the experience like opening that bank account? It wasn't that bad. I mean, it was years oh, ago. Geez, it was like 98. That was too bad, though. <laughs> I mean, you had two letters of reference and I wonder. I did. It. I had a level. Well, I, you mean, I, I just, I didn't think it was going to be any easier than it was. But wait, right? you went through uh, knowing it was going to be tough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so uh, I went in with my passport and, you know, family members. Right. right? <laughs> you, brought, you brought your money to, to open your bank exactly. account. I love it. I love it. <laughs> That was my reference. That was my ID. That was the national ID. So uh, and so, when it becomes simpler, do you look forward to being able to just log on? I do. I really do. So hearing this conversation was very helpful because now when I go 
And I'm like, oh, I need to do a transaction. They're asking me for, I, they've asked me for my national ID and they told me that I need to apply for one. But yeah. hearing this, I'm like more in, in interested in applying for one. Now. Right. Yeah. So, no, and so that's exactly what I want people to realize that there are Jamaicans in the diaspora who want to do more business in Jamaica, but this issue exists and that prevents yeah. us from actually doing that. So as far as I'm saying, here trying to open an account is, is more difficult than in, than in the US. And it's funny to see Nicole say here because yeah. Nicole is American, but she's in Jamaica right yeah. now. I'm jealous, Nicole. But yes, yeah. it is it is ridiculously more difficult to, to, to open an account. So it's about business is actually fairly simple in Jamaica. Closing is hard. Opening mm. a business, Jamaica ranks, I believe, Trevor, in the top 10. I think we're ranked number yeah. eight for yeah. opening in the whole world. So really? Oh, yeah, Jamaica was ranked, I believe, number eight in the Doing Business Index for opening, for setting up a business. So it's super easy to open the business. But then you need to go and get all the tax-related things, so your TRN, tax IDs, and, and then opening the bank account, though, we do not rank in the top 10, right? I don't think we're in the top 50. And not, not even close to doing that. So now, how do you see those things getting easier affecting your ability to do business in Jamaica, Minister. Because you really do want to help hire Jamaicans in Jamaica to work on especially the software side of, of contracts that you would earn these contracts in North America, the US and, and Canada. Right. Yeah, right, right. Uh, I think it would be a lot more simpler to go through the process, especially as a business owner, because now, I mean, even in the US, certain things are, are difficult. Um, not everything is easy. Right. Uh, and so, but one of the things that I've seen uh, in terms of what I'm calling like the public single sign on as what Trevor mm -hmm. was talking about basically is that once we have that available throughout the Caribbean, especially in Jamaica, will make it a lot easier for us to communicate, for us to um, help those who have or want the privacy and their, their personal sovereignty in place. I think it's very important because we don't want to be responsible for anybody's data, right? We right. want them to responsible for their data and, and take ownership of that. So I think it will be very helpful for us in the future. No, I got to hear that. See, guys, we, we need this stuff because it allows more business to come to Jamaica and then hire and pay better wages. Yeah. So, Trevor, I know you're familiar with this one. I'm going to bring up Estonia. They obviously are essentially a model for, for that digital control of, of information, national ID system. But I also think of Estonia and my brain just goes towards, you know, blockchain and those other things so just give a little bit of background on what estonia has done and how that has benefited their society uh, with having mm -hmm. that national id system and and the ability to track who accessed your, your data right and so, then into the blockchain conversation to, to wind it out right right yeah it's an excellent segue there right <laughs> so, yeah well, i'll uh, try i'll try, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> so so one of the fundamental challenges that <clears throat> that we that people have and, and we have it more so in Jamaica is um trust. It's a big challenge. Um and that that idea of trust um you know exponentially um eviscerates when you start to work in the digital space. So people don't trust things they can't see. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you're playing in a digital space, um, it's easy for stuff to get manipulated, it's easy for stuff to get stolen. So people really don't want to. This is why people still line up in, in the line at a bank every morning because they don't want to do business online because they want to go in there and know that I gave my money to you. You are the one who got it. If anything happened to it, I'm coming back to you. <laughs> you are the one who stole my money. Right? They can put a face. Mm -hmm. to, to this action, right? So what you find now is you're caught in this conundrum because you need to, 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 to move into the digital realm, but you still need to establish the trust level um, while you're functioning in that realm. Um, and for years, for decades, trying to establish a certain level of trust and 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 auditing that was not based on human interaction or engagement was very difficult. Um, and that is what, in a nutshell, blockchain is meant to address and has addressed. Now, many people 
want to hear blockchain they're associated with you know cryptocurrencies and so right. it's so much more than that much more um, and and what 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 blockchain does for you is remember that matrix of information that that is created because you know now we have this unique identifier that is my national id and there's information that is moving around various systems with or without my knowledge if you take all of that and sit it on top of of, of a blockchain based platform what what it does is it allows you now to be able to track self audit publish every aspect of a transaction or your information that has been touched um, but the, the cool thing about that because you're saying well yeah we can do that anyway we have technology systems that that do audits and, and all that wonderful stuff you know you have databases that you give people access to and some people don't have access to it and so on yes but there's always one guy that has all the access right um and and that's who people zero in on because I, I don't know who that guy is and i don't trust him so i'm going to change something right um what blockchain does is it eliminates all of that and it creates a, a way of um monitoring uh, managing transactions in such a way that whenever a transaction occurs and it's written to what's called the blockchain it can never be tampered with mm. it's a mutable record of something that happened and every time a new record is written to the blockchain it becomes harder and harder to tamper with the records before it right um, it's, it's, it's extremely secure um, it uses, you know, uh, something called elliptical curve um, cryptography. Um, to, so complicated. Or yeah, to secure and to 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 make sure that the data on 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 the chain is is so secure that even if somebody with 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 you know um, the resources to try to crack the uh, encryption and you, you kind of need you know some very powerful uh computing power to do that um even if somebody tried to do it you would know immediately wow. so how does that apply to to regular day situations is if i gave a company some information on me and that system sits on the blockchain and it is designed to notify me whenever somebody accesses my info all right it's not waiting for them to, wow. to, to, to notify me. It tells me automatically that somebody accessed your information. And if you think about it, when you look at how blockchain is using the cryptocurrency world, you can see every single transaction that occurred um, in Bitcoin from mm. day one. Mm. Um, if, if I'm able to see who accessed my info or when my information was accessed, without need for somebody in there you know sending that to me then i'm able to immediately see when somebody's querying my info when i don't think they should be. Ah. and if you have a system that that does that for me i'll start to trust the system more so one of the underpinnings of blockchain is to by its nature um grow trust in technology-based uh, services and systems by removing the normal need for trust. So it creates trust by removing the need for trust, right? Because we typically trust people, it removes that. Because what it's doing now is it's creating a new type of trust uh, based on the fact that it is letting me know when my information was accessed and I can then determine uh if it was needed if yeah. that access was needed now in estonia they they created uh, so their entire system all their systems now are, are built on blockchain based platforms um because they saw that it was imperative that the citizen trust these systems that they're using so when somebody can go on their phone and and, and vote go on their phone and, and fill a prescription, 
go on their phone and do almost anything. And there has to be some embedded trust that when I, you know, instantiate this transaction, everything that's happening is, is trackable. So if I dispute certain things, there is a record of something somewhere that is not managed by a person. Ah. It is automatically done by a system that is 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 that people are removed from. And if people try to tamper with that system, the system lets you know. Mm. So when you talk about trust, transparency, accountability, that's what blockchain technology brings. So 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 now when you're talking about uh, data sovereignty, when you're talking about national IDs, and when you're talking about linking siloed systems, a critical underpinning of all of that is technology like blockchain to ensure that people can trust what it is is happening behind the scenes because we have a trust deficit here in Jamaica. We have a corruption problem. Yeah. Well if 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 you know that you know you 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 go and go fast in somebody's business when you're not supposed to do it and the system records that um you'll immediately um get flagged and caught. This happened in Estonia actually because I remember I had an opportunity to talk to some of the guys who did develop that that platform or one of the many platforms they have over there and one of my questions he was like look how did you manage to get people to to not try to circumvent the system and that's always like that was very easy it happened to them three times mm -mm. Right? um in the, in the enti entire existence of that system, fabulous system ever they say it happened three times and and one, we were able to tell when it happened immediately. Wow. And one instance was a guy, you know, just opened somebody's record to, to go and read some information and he didn't need to because it wasn't part of his job description. Um, and they found out immediately, pulled the guy up, um, uh, uh, relieved him of his duties and then publicized it. Mm. They yeah. got it happened to them three times. They made a, a spectacle of these people. It never happened again. Therefore, again. The thing about it was they were able to see when it happened and they enforced in a very public way um, the action they took. And what that did was it caused people to trust the system. That's the biggest hurdle that we... It's not the technology. It's the trust. And you need, for nearly a technology, to build that trust. NIDS is great, but NIDS is going to need uh, blockchain technologies and underpinning for people to eventually trust what it will enable. Oh man, thank you very much Trevor. I'm going to let you go now for the rest of your day. We've, we've taken an hour out of your business time and we just learned a whole lot. And I think most of us are going to go and change our passwords today <laughs> and check on all the browser extensions. <laughs> So, thank you very much. We will talk with you again, man. Thanks, Trevor. It's my pleasure. Um, you, man. Alyssa, great. Nice meeting you. Um, and, and you yeah. know, I, I, I appreciate um, your, your inviting me to, to come and speak. Yeah, man. All right. Thank you, Trevor. So, Melissa, we're going to close off with you. We, we've gone a little bit over the hour, but that's fine. This I felt was a really important topic because for me, I look at the Caribbean, especially in Jamaica. I look at the performance of NCU and UTEC in the Microsoft Imagine Cup for the last 13 years, usually placing in the top three, sometimes winning. And I feel that we have so many overlooked opportunities and people in the region and in Jamaica in particular who yeah. could benefit from those opportunities. And we shouldn't be waiting on companies in Jamaica to decide to go after these international opportunities. We, we're probably going to need to depend on us in the diaspora who already have existing businesses, already winning contracts like you with Orca Intelligence to then say, you know what, I'm going to hire some people I had and train them and help upskill or partner with a heart trust NTA or, or something like that. Is, is that where your brain is as well? Yes. Yes. So, I'm looking at partnering with a lot of organizations in order to do this, right? Like you and I and Nicole as well, we've had this conversation where I am looking to train people and bring them on board to help organizations and be able to advance their careers pretty rapidly, right? Right. Uh, I think it's important that 
we spend time training people so that they can build quality types of skill sets to advance themselves and their families. So. I, I love that you said that you're not entirely focused on just profit. You said you want to help people advance themselves, yeah, their families, which is is what I think is is really important for for people to realize when we have diaspora direct investment investing down there. We are not just coming to make a profit. We are coming to to do good and do well at the right. same time. Some of that profit does have to come back to the parent company in the US, but a lot of that money will stay. In, in the country and there's a multiplier effect, right? When you can pay this person above what they would normally get paid uh, yeah. in, in Jamaica, for example, that's good. They, they spend that money within the economy, which then multiplies after buy lunch down there, they're going to pay their utility bills down there. They're going yeah. to spend it and buy clothes down there. So yeah. no, all right, I, I love that. So what do you want to close with? If anybody had to, to only come in right at the end and they just see these last, this last two minutes, what would you want them to leave from this with? Um, I would have to say that, you know, if anyone's interested in IT, cybersecurity, software development, the main thing is to not be afraid of it. Uh, one of the things that I teach people is that it's a collaborative art. Mm. You know, so see mm. IT, seeing being in the information technology industry as art. Every day I'm, I'm, I make music. That is my goal. Like cool. look at data, data all together are different sections of music. And so if you're into music, if you're into being, you know, a sound engineer, if you're into even like, you know, my family comes from, we're from a construction family, we're from, you know, from Mason. So uh, if you're into building, that is what IT is all about. You take those same skill sets, you transfer them into the IT environment. And I think that in the, you know, in the Caribbean culture and, you know, especially in Jamaica, there are a lot of those skill sets there that we can transform the art, the engineering, and all of those sound skills that we have into technology. So. Oh, man, I, I'm so glad to hear that. And, and the last thing I want to close with, it would be remiss of me not to point out that you are a black woman in tech. And, and we need to simply say one thank you for being representative of, of what is possible. We think more people need to see people like you and more women, especially more girls need to realize that I can be in tech, I can be in the sciences and and let's get it to be to the point where it's, it's, it's at least 50-50, at least, right? So exactly. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a struggle. Nice. Yeah, man. All right, thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm uh, really looking forward to, to working with you and bringing some opportunities to Jamaica and the wider Caribbean. So excited. Thank you for today. Thank you as well. Take care. Take care. Later. So guys, that was our episode on cybersecurity and opportunities in the Caribbean. I want to thank you know Trevor Forrest and Melissa Daly for being my guest today. I know this is a topic that might be even more complicated than most of us would be thinking of, but I think this is a huge opportunity, right? Strong long-term growth industry, no question. Uh, we live in a tech-enabled society. It is the fourth industrial revolution. And if you're looking to invest or you're looking for, for long-term careers, I think you should be looking in the cybersecurity space and be considering that. Not saying you have to become a programmer or a cybersecurity expert, but those companies need people as well in marketing, in management, in advertising, the PR, I need people to do accounting and bookkeeping. So they're normal companies. But I think that those are some of the industries that you guys should be looking at. We are looking at investing in them. Uh, we already have invested in that space in Jamaica. We, we can't make the announcement as yet, but I definitely think we need to be paying attention to that. And, and hopefully things will be in place around you know, national IDs in Jamaica, in Barbados, uh, and other countries that are rolling that out. So it becomes easier for us to do business, open accounts, and manage our data. I love what Trevor brought up about you know, data sovereignty. That was important, having control over our data and trusting the systems in place. And, and what he said was uh, the most important thing is that we need to make sure there are consequences, right? People need to see enforcement if they're going to have trust because we have to admit that the Caribbean is a low trust environment and a lot will have to happen in order to uh, get it into a medium trust and in a high trust environment. So thank you to everyone. I see Daryl McIntosh saying great episode, pointing out those growth industries. 
And that is the reason behind doing this. I want to help educate people, not just on the opportunities that that I believe exist, but also why they are opportunities. And specifically pointing out the companies and countries we are investing in. We are actively investing. Right? Uh, all I can say is that we own 5% of a company based in Jamaica that is in that space of cybersecurity and where things are going, blockchain and so on. And, and I'm excited to eventually be able to announce that, but stay tuned and really excited. So everybody stay safe. One love, we're signing off. Respect.